Welcome to the CanMed Coffee Talk podcast, where we talk with the leading minds in cannabis science, medicine, cultivation, and safety testing. I am your host, Ben Amaralt. I am the marketing manager at Medicinal Genomics and proud member of the team that puts on the CanMed conference. Well, the list of names participating in CanMed 24 continues to grow. We have now added our first batch of poster presenters to our speaker page. So I encourage you to check those out at canmedevents.com. While you are there, you can also check out the CanMed Archive, which is our searchable video library of all the past CanMed presentations. Please also, while you're there, sign up for email alerts so you can stay up to date on all things related to the CanMed 24 Innovation and Investment Summit. We still have a few more announcements up our sleeve, so do stay tuned. By the way, ticket packages are still available for CanMed 24. Go to canmedevents.com to learn all about the different packages that we have available and read about all the amenities that come with them. And if you want to learn more about what makes CanMed unique and unlike any other cannabis conference, check out the link in the show description. Our marketing team put together a great blog that highlights all the ways that CanMed is unique. My guest today is Akeem Gardner, who at CanMed 24 will present Effect of Canflavins on Mitigating Motor Neuron Disease. Akeem is the founder and CEO of Canerda. He is an innovative entrepreneur with over five years of experience in industrial hemp enterprises. He has a proven track record in leading high-performance teams that work across multi-channel platforms in strategically aligning profitability with sustainability and economic development in Ontario. During our conversation, we discuss the minor molecules found in cannabis that Canerda is investigating for therapeutics, Canerda's process for evaluating indications for canflavins and polyphenols, how the diverse molecules in cannabis make it a great therapeutic for a multifactorial disease like ALS, the potential for canflavins and polyphenols to be used as an anti-inflammatory nutraceutical, and more. Before we get to my conversation with Akeem, I want to thank this episode's sponsor, the American Cannabis Nurses Association. ACNA is a national nursing organization whose mission is to advance excellence in cannabis nursing practice through advocacy, collaboration, education, research, and policy development. Founded in 2010, ACNA continues to work on providing their members with up-to-date cannabis information and resources to care for patients who use cannabis. Join them today at CannabisNurses.org and be part of the change. Okay, and without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Akeem Gardner. Good afternoon, Akeem. Thanks so much for joining us on the podcast. Oh, thank you for having me here, Ben. Excited to be back. Looking forward to CanMed 2024 as well. Yeah. It, yeah. No, it is great to have you back on the po- podcast. And as you mentioned, you're returning for CanMed 24. You did give a great presentation at CanMed 23 about the research your team performed on using canflavins to treat glioblastoma. And I'll put a link in the show description so people can can check that out. And as we said, you're coming back again this year to share data related to how canflavins again may help treat patients with motor neuron disease. But before we dive into that, I was checking out your website at canerda.com before we jumped on. And it seems like there's a lot of activity going on there. So why don't you catch us up on what you've been working on since last we spoke? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Yes, as you can see, we are very, very busy bees up here in Toronto doing a lot of research on these minor molecules found in the plant, not only the canflavins, but other penylated flavonoids, still beans for benzyls that are there in cannabis industrial hemp as well. And as you know, and as we know with uh, right, with all botanicals, with the cannabinoids, all these molecules, they have um, uh, multi-targets. They work on 
different aspects of the body to do different things in various diseases. So over the last year, we've been really, really trying to narrow down in on our research on the applications of what these molecules and ingredients can do on their own and in different combinations. And how do you actually get products out of these botanical uh, botanical drug candidates, but also nutraceuticals that can go to the market much sooner and help people out in a quicker in a quicker period of time. Excellent. Okay, so I heard you mention there's some additional molecules that you're looking at because last time we 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 focused on the can flavins A and B last we spoke. So I'm curious uh, what these what these new molecules are. We did, and and um, but and I yeah, I can't remember if I said it last time. Probably didn't, but at Canerda, we really want to be the company that you go to when you think anything cannabis hemp polyphenol related. So in these polyphenols and in minor concentrations in the plant, so there are groups of prenylated flavonoids, which would include the can 5 and a can 5 and b and others. It would include still beans, berbenzyles. Berbenzyles are ingredients like canaprene, cannabis still bean, um, so still beans or berbenzyles, and other ingredients as well that have yet to be characterized. All in all, I think there's about seven or eight molecules that have been identified in literature, but there's no validated standards to be able to identify these at a consistent basis. And they're very, very small and very, very small concentrations in the plant. So we are working on multiple ways of um, enriching extracts for these ingredients, then being able to isolate them, purify them, and then test them all out for their bioactivity. That way, when we're putting combinations together, we're sure we can be or make better um, guesses or hypotheses, hypotheses about what these ingredients can do when it comes to treating both humans and animals in a variety of different health conditions. Excellent. So you say small concentrations. How small are we talking? Well, if we look at the can flavins, the, the lead ones, these ones are the ones that we can get most reliably, and these ones are found in under 0.014% of the plant's biomass on average. Wow. Everything else is less than that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. So we we really have to, and the first patent that we designed, or the researchers at the university designed, was a way of specifically concentrating, then identifying, isolating, and then purifying all of these molecules so that when we're doing HPLC or NMR or whatever or whatnot, um, mass spec, we actually know what's there. We can identify the various molecules that are there and then we can develop standards for these molecules um, with our biosynthesis technology as well. Awesome. So with the plant making such small concentrations, is that the best way to produce these um, molecules or do you have some other sort of uh, process for that? Well, the best way for us to get these molecules right now is extraction. The beauty of our extraction process is it's a commercially feasible way of, again, concentrating, isolating, and purifying so that we can get these molecules. In the future, there may be another way that we um, come up with. We have a couple of other methods under investigation, right? And again, like I said, this is what we ultimately want to be known at, known for at Pinerno being the ones that can get these molecules in a reliable fashion at the standards or at the level or with the characterization that the FDA or any other regulator around the world wants for botanical ingredients, botanical API. Great. No, and I know a big part of what you do at Canerda is you investigate different um, indications um, that might be a good, a good target for these molecules. Um, and again, like I said, I was looking at the website and there it looks like there's a lot of different things you're looking at. So I'm curious, how do you decide which conditions um, you want to investigate and sort of what's your process for sort of um, evaluating these? Well, as a halfway joke, right? Partly ask ChatGPT. <laughs> hey, we have these molecules. They have these sort of um, um, endpoints and activity. How might they be able to help, Right. That's a halfway joke because um, we do use AI and bioinformaticians to help screen our molecules and give uh, um, us information for where we think this might be most applicable. Um, one of the things that we know that our ingredients do very well is they target the inflammatory related pathways. And we know that chronic inflammation 
Um, systematic chronic inflammation is related to a wide variety of diseases. Usually everything starts as that slow burning continuous inflammation goes undetected, then it can turn into cancer, into neurodegenerative problems, into cardiovascular problems, so on and so forth. So where we start is we look at, okay, um, what areas of disease or what other indications are related to A, inflammation, um, even if inflammation isn't the primary um, driver of that disease, do our molecules hit other targets that are related to that disease? For example, in our cancer program for glioblastoma, we found that our molecules also hit TREP B, so that we were able to go down that pathway. But then really what I try to do is I try to find a key opinion leader, someone who's used to doing the academic or preclinical or discovery work required to be able to validate the ideas, the hypotheses that we have. So in Canada, we are very fortunate to have a wide variety of um, universities um, with a lot of investigators with the government programs that can fund um, student research so that professors with the oversight can lead a PhD or a master's student or even sometimes undergrad student, students to, to do a series of experiments for us, proof of concept experiments for us that will give us the information we need to deductively reason and say, yes, this is what we wanna do, or this is where we think we have the highest chance of success, or we can turn this around in a reasonable time because from this batch of experiments and work previously done, we can fast track this into the clinic, which we're trying to do with our first asset, our lead asset for motor neuron disease, ALS. Right. Okay, so that was going to be sort of my next question is, you know, which one of these indications is sort of the furthest along or closest to actually doing clinical trials? And it sounds like it's um, this ALS motor neuron um, application. Motor neuron disease? I, I think so, right? Excellent. Over the last year, we've learned a lot about ALS motor neuron disease. We've learned a lot about how the cannabis plant has helped people suffering from neurological ailments um, um, since the beginning of time in a variety of different cultures. And again, leaning on the experience of Dr. Ethan Russo, our senior medical advisor, um, and what the work that they did formerly at GW Pharma, we know that cannabis can help in severe neurological diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, and ALS, motor neuron disease, is an area where these patients, they need help. A lot of them use cannabis right now to help manage their symptoms but they don't have something standardized and the practitioner doesn't always know what the patient is using, even though they can come into the clinic and say, hey, we're using cannabis, we feel better, we're eating more, so on and so forth. So our goal is to be able to leverage all the work previously done along with some of the new work that we're doing right now to be able to move this forward into the clinic and really help a patient population that's looking for answers, that's looking for um, help that's looking for a better quality of life and really deserves to have it. Excellent. And now um, the therapeutic that you're sort of evaluating, is that a like a, a single molecule um, therapeutic or is it sort of a, a combination of, of different compounds? What does that look like? So generally speaking, when we evaluate um, our assets in any indication, we put a series of different candidates in there. So we will put like um, highly purified single can, can flab and can A. We'll put can A extract, and then we could put combination extract in there and see what performs best mm. um, based on the mixture, the cocktail mixture, the um, almost entourage or synergistic approach, right? Now, based on the work previously done and based on, again, being a student of Dr. Russo, we know that in the clinic for humans, it's probably not going to be a single mixture, a, a single ingredient that has the best opportunity to help these patients. It's going to be a cocktail mixture, a cocktail approach, not dissimilar to how these patients are getting treated right mm. now, but we could talk about that a little bit later. Um, as I was saying, we put together a series of um, different molecules found in the plant at various concentrations, at safe concentrations that we believe can be delivered to patients chronically on an everyday basis that can help them manage their symptoms, that can improve their quality of life, and might also be neuroprotective as well um, and help them with survival. So we think that we have something that can be disease modifying. Now we just have to continue to go out and improve it. Great. 
And so, and so where are we at now? And I mean, maybe let's, how about a little preview? I don't want you to give away too much because we want people to come out to the event, but um, what, what are you looking to present at, at CanMed? So at CanMed, I, we have a series of, again, previous literature that's been done, but also some unique exper experiments that we've recently done to validate that our combination actually does work how we think it's going to work. So I'm really excited to share some of this information, share, again, the process that we went through mm -hmm. from looking at all the things previously done to adding our unique twists on it and then showing uh, what the result is and how we got it to work in our favor. Excellent. Excellent. And now you touched on it before um, when you were talking about ALS, like what are sort of the therapeutics that ALS patients are using now um, and, you know, why is yours potentially a better solution? So, um, well, I'll start first really quickly with what is ALS, right? Sure, yeah. And ALS is a pretty severe neurodegenerative disease, right? It comes in a variety of different forms. It's a really complex disorder where a lot of things are going, are going on, and people don't really understand why um, patients get it, why they, um, as soon as they get it, there are two to three years usually until uh, to mortality. Um, they usually, as soon, when they get it, they end up in a wheelchair. They have to have tubes to help with their feeding, right? Really, really rapid progression and debilitating uh, motor neuron disease. Um, right now, because of the complexity of ALS, again, even though it was first discovered 150 years ago, there's no cure to me still, right? And it's because yeah. of the complexity of what's going on in the CNS and in the motor neurons. So most recently, um, and I think as of today, there's four slash, I think, and uh, torfacin and becomes the fifth um, drug that's approved for the treatment of this disease. But the thing about all these different treatments is none of them extend survival in a meaningful way. None of them cure the disease. None of them help manage the symptoms. And because ALS is so complex between patient to patient, there's so many different gene irre irregularities and different things going on. Um, right now, practitioners, they sort of prescribe to the patient in this cocktail approach. Here, take all four treatments, right? And all four will maybe help you um, on your journey. So what we aim to do, instead of having to have the patient have um, four or five different treatments to help them, we aim to put all the benefits of the cannabis plant and the various different ingredients in the cannabis plant into a single or a monotherapy that they can take on a day-to-day -day basis that will not only help them address their various different symptoms, their pain, help them sleep better, help them with their hunger and their appetite, help them with um, um, keeping on muscle mass, um, but also, improve their quality of life, and then potentially be neuroprotective as well and extend their survival. We think we have a sort of all-in-one approach, and this is where we get to benefit from the, multi the multiple applications of the cannabis plant and all its various indications. We don't need one thing to do one thing very well. When you're dealing with a complex disease mm -hmm. like ALS, you sort of need the polypharmological approach. And this is where we get this advantage, plus the added advantage of having our super potent anti-inflammatories and our can flavins in this mixture. Excellent, excellent. No, and you mentioned so the current medications they they don't relieve symptoms, they don't extend lifespan. And there was, I think there was another thing you said there that they're not doing. So what are they doing? Well, they help, right? Mm. Um, um, but they don't cure. There's no cure for ALS, right? We don't really understand what's going on. And again, each of these medicines, they're designed to specifically do one or another thing, um, help with patient um, subpopulations of ALS patients that have um, one disease modification off or another, right? But they don't help in a broad spectrum, if you would call it, to the broader population. Right. And none of them, none of them address the symptoms like we know we can address the symptoms with cannabis. That's why ALS patients, even if they're taking a medicine one or the other, they'll still often smoke cannabis or have a, a tincture or have a topical or something like that 
to be able to help them with the symptoms that they're also suffering from. So, so this is where, yeah, this is where we think we can come in and we can really help because, again, we know things like cannabis helps with spasticity, it helps with muscle spasms, cramps, the pain, the fatigue, depression, nausea, so on and so forth. Um, and we know that with cannabis, you can have these benefits, have an improved quality of life without a host of a whole bunch of other adverse effects. Excellent. Yeah. And it sort of seems to kind of illustrate, you know, the difference between cannabis medicine approach and a traditional pharma approach, right? It's like pharma is, is like you said, typically focused on, you know, a single molecule for a single ed, um, indication. Um, which it sounds like is what's being used for ALS now, but it's not really effective because it is such a um, a broad uh, disease where it's it's not sort of a one size fits all, and that's where something like a a cannabis might actually be a better approach because it it can help in so many different ways. It can be if you can deliver it with the CMC and at the pharmaceutical standard, ready? Mm. Um, in pharma, they do do combination therapies. Like I mentioned, they still use the cocktail approach for ALS. They have four approved diseases, uh, four approved medicines, sorry, that can help treat one aspect or another of the disease. And then they deliver it together in the combination approach. But the easier way to get it approved um because you have to do the clinical trial, because you have to have the CMC and be able to produce it consistently every single time, right? It's to have one thing that does one thing very well, get it to market, and then let the practitioners prescribe yeah. it or use it to help their patients. This is where, again, um, our learnings from those that have done it before, those that have done it at the pharmaceutical standard with Sativex and Epidiolex, we get the benefit of understanding how do you make this happen? How do you make this happen with botanical mixtures? How do you make this happen with cannabis? And how do you, and once you can do that from a, a production way, from a clinical trial way, from a batch to batch repeatability way, then the patients get all the real benefits that cannabis can offer in a standardized, consistent method. Yeah. I mean, the whole consistency thing, that is one of the greatest challenges with cannabis medicine for sure. Um, so an another, but another challenge with cannabis medicine is, of course, the cost. Um, so I'm curious, and maybe it's way too soon to tell, but like, how would the, you know, the cost of this type of therapeutic sort of compare to uh, kind of the standard uh, ALS treatment? Probably a little bit soon to tell, right? Yeah. A lot of that's going to come in, uh, come after we finish our full scale up, our CMC, and have the cost of good souls. But the thing is, is once you get it through the clinical trials, once you get it uh, approved by regulators, then the payers, the insurance will pay for it, right? Mm -hmm. And the nice thing about this is that it's not just res restricted to a medical cannabis program. When you get it approved as a drug, you can cross interstate lines and the big insurance companies um, can pay for it, not only in the US, but also this is the approach that will take in targeting the payers and getting the payers to approve reimbursement all over the world. Excellent. No, I know you're up there in Canada, which is a little bit different than the U.S. because you do have a, a federal medical cannabis program up there. Um, so with the path to getting the payers to um, reimburse or, or pay for um, this therapeutic, uh, is it an easier path up there than the U.S.? Probably I'm not going to say easier because, again, we're not going to go down the medical cannabis route to start. We're going after pharmaceutical, right? Got it. So we'll go the same route as traditional pharmaceuticals like GW uh, Pharma did with Epidiolex and Sativex to get full reimbursement. But that's not to say that we don't have a fallback plan if we have to go to a fallback plan. Excellent. Always good to have a fallback plan. Exactly. Um, and in what concent you we mentioned before um, that these are in very low concentrations in the plant. Um, at what sort of concentrations are these um, these compounds effective? Is it um, a little goes a long way? Well, again, different dosages for different indications. And our ALS formulation is a combination of a variety of different things, including our can flavins. Mm. So in the ALS formulation, we don't need a lot of can flavin A to, or B to work um, to help the patient because it's not working alone, right? 
versus another indication we may want more of it because the CAM5 might do something better than uh, a terpene or another cannabinoid for that example, right? Mm. Or, or the CAM5 might even just work better all alone instead of in combination for a different type of disease. So it really depends on what we're talking about and who we're aiming to help. And I'll also say it also depends on the physical makeup of the person. For example, um, we have some of our extracts right now, um, our pilot scale extracts that are not in the market yet, but I consume them, right? But I'm 6'5", 240. My mom isn't 6'5", 240. So where my mom takes one, one um, tincture, one droplet, one tincture full of our extract, I have to take two or three to get equal therapeutic dose. So this is some of the complexities about cannabis and about humans and about making pharmaceuticals because all of us have different genetic makeups, different physical makeups, right? What works for one person might not work for the other. So sometimes you may have to titrate up to your dose, find your maximum tolerable dose and do what works for you. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, that's it's the standard. That's that's what... um. Bonnie Goldstein and uh, Dustin Sulak and yep. Ethan Russo, of course, uh, all of them talk about exactly. and they'll be talking about again this year at the medical practicum. So we're excited about that. So, so you said that you you take um, one of your extracts um, daily, or is that just for kind of general wellness? Or, well, for general wellness, and I can't put something on the market that I haven't put through the ringer myself. Me and my Husky Sky, we're Canerta 1.0 taste testers. <laughs> if Sky loves it, if I'm okay, then I feel good with everyone else. So um, I do take it right now for general for general wellness. Also, um, I'm currently our longest um, safety study, our long-term safety study, because I've been taking it since day one, right? And wanted to make sure that, again, no stomach issues, no nausea, no adverse events, right? I feel really, really fine. The other thing that I can say about our extract, the one of the things that I've come to found is um, the other day I hurt my back in the gym mm -hmm. and it was a crazy day. I was deadlifting. I was deadlifting angry. You should never deadlift angry because that's when injuries happen. And I learned it the hard way. But it was very interesting because when I tweaked my um, the muscle in my back, um, I still had a range of motion. I knew I was hurt. I felt that I was hurt, but I could still move. I could still get through my workout. Versus traditionally, uh, or if I, well, traditionally, I'll say, uh, my back would lock up. So after that injury happened, I remember the next day, the next two days I was taking my extract. Again, I was like, I slept okay. I woke up, my back didn't lock up. I wasn't super sore. I'm like, this is weird. But is this in my head, right? Because <laughs> I want our extract to work more than anyone. But I'm like, I definitely know I'm injured. Um, and then... Uh, I remember me and my mom, we were sharing a bottle at that time. So I left the bottle at home and I went to my fiance's. I stayed, spent the weekend at my fiance's. I woke up the Saturday morning and I hadn't had the extract. And I'm like, okay, I'm starting to feel a little bit more tightness in my back, right? But I'm okay, right? I still have my range of motion. I can get in and out of my car, stand up, sit down, okay. But then the Sunday when I woke up, my back was locked. I was like, this is completely messed. I can't believe this is what my back was going through this whole time. I don't know what's going on. I called my mom immediately. Mom, I'm coming home to take the rest of the bottle right now. Sorry, you could get from the next batch because there's no, like I couldn't, every time I was getting up, sitting down, it was so tight. I had to like, you know, you know, when you're injured and it's really tight, you have to like yeah. slowly but surely bring yourself down. And then um, no lie, I started to take my extract again at the usual dose. And then again, uh, the next day and the day after, I was still hurt, but I had my range of motion. I can get in and out of my car without thinking twice about it. And wow. I was like, this is actually like really illuminating because if um, I'm 33 right now, but we know that as people age, as um, they get more chronic ailments, more arthritic, so on and so forth, that they're going through things like this. I think that an extract like this can really help, really help improve quality of life really help them just manage the symptoms of whatever they're going through. And that was um, the first real time where I was like, okay, I know what I read. I know what I'm seeing in the experience, experiments, but now I actually felt it in my own body about the power of this extract, the power of the enriched extracts and what it can do.
Wow. No, so that's some, that's some power powerful anti-inflammatory there, huh? It was it was definitely helpful. And again, ever since then, I'm like, nope, mom, you have to wait for the second. I have to have a bottle with me at all times. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Um, so in in kind of winding down here, I did want to kind of check in with you too, because we mentioned at the top that you spoke last year about using canned flavins for uh glioblastoma. Um, I'm wondering what's happened uh, on that front since then. Um, is that is that mm -hmm. also kind of moving along the uh um the pipeline mm -hmm. so slowly but surely cancer is very difficult and tricky sure als complex as well cancer even more right um we're still continuing that project is still going on at the university of Guelph. we're actually getting ready to do a series of organoid studies and not only for glioblastoma breast cancer and breast cancer metastasis studies as well because again we know that our molecules have the Trek B activity plus their potent anti-inflammatories. These are still being done at a preclinical phase. The challenge that we are going to have right now is I really need key opinion leaders and people who can help us do the work at the next phase. I'm not a practicing doctor, uh, a practicing doctor. I'm not a principal investigator in the traditional right, right? And I don't see these patients. So really for us, uh, the next phase of work that we need to do once these sets of experiments um, are complete, is finding someone who's interested in looking at uh, future alternatives to cancer treatments, small molecule cancer treatments, and taking a look at the data that we have and having the experience and the know-how to be able to help us take this forward. Excellent. We well, have some. We have. Yeah, you know, we have some ideas about about um, other areas of cancer that we might be able to help him, like things like cancer pain, which are inflammation related. But when it comes to things like, again, glioblastoma, brain cancer, um, breast cancer, we really need people um, from the community, from out there in the rest of the world to help us move those things. Excellent. Well, I do know an, of an event that's happening in May where there's a lot of uh, clinicians uh, who might be able to help you out. So. <laughs> uh, a hundred percent for sure. Last year, all the feedback and the people that I met at CanMed were awesome. Um, uh, and a lot of interesting leads that I am very excited to follow up on this year to be able to show, okay, now we know that we can actually do X, Y, and Z. Now can we actually, and we can actually produce more. Now what are the next steps to actually getting this one step further down the line? Excellent. Oh, happy to uh, foster those relationships for sure. Um, no, I do actually want to circle back about, you know, your story about sort of using the extract as a, as an anti-inflammatory and sort of as almost like a, a, a preventative or general wellness. Now, is that another line that you're pursuing as well as um, sort of making this available to, uh, to folks to, to take regularly or when they yes. deadlift angry? Yes. So, so hopefully this year, um, sometime between Q2 and Q3, we will have an extract ready for launch in the U.S. markets. We have a group that we've been working with in Oregon. Shout out to F Soil. Um, they we've been able to transfer our technology to them. They've been working on scaling it up. Um, now we're at the last step on making sure that um, our excipients, uh, our excipients and our ingredients stays in excipients in the carrier oil that we have our bottling and our labeling and all worked out. And then we will be launching this in an e-commerce type of a way. So very, very soon, we're right around the corner. This isn't a high concentration camp lab in, uh, extract product, but it is an enriched polyphenol product. The camp labins are in it in more of an amount than any other product that's on the market as of today. It's not at our full botanical drug characterization level yet, but it doesn't have to be as a nutraceutical and as a health and wellness product. So for us, again, the most important thing is going to be getting this into the hands of people who need it the most, allowing these ingredients to start to get into their um, daily consumption patterns, um, allow it to start to accumulate in the body and do what it does well, even if it be at a more of a nutraceutical health and wellness everyday level. And for those suffering more from severe chronic disorders, we'll continue to do our clinical trial research, our batch-to-batch um, production and our scale up so that we can serve them as soon as possible thereafter. Wow. 
That's great. That's exciting. Um, I mean, I, I personally, I take CBDA every day or after all my workouts. So I'd be definitely, mm -hmm. definitely be interested in uh, checking out your products once they're out there. Um, all right, Akeem, winding down here, I did want to give you an opportunity to um, plug any additional resources that you think the listeners might be interested in learning more about the, the topics we have been talking about. And then, of course, uh, your website, social media, anything like that, please plug away. Awesome. So for anyone who's interested in learning more, always feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or on my email. It's just Akeem at Kinerda.com. On our website in our journal area, so kernerda.com backslash journal, we have a bunch of different resources there, including um, um, new literature or new data as it comes about. Um, um, we look to post it there and it usually goes on LinkedIn. But what I would ultimately say is to come to CanMed 2024. CanMed 2024 was very important for me last year. I'm learning about where the state of cannabis research is meeting all the different key people, leaders and the patient, people who are treating patients suffering from a variety of different things with cannabis and also allowing us to tell our story. So I was very happy to be able to get on that stage for the first time last year, really excited to follow that on with um, more actionable items this year and continue to grow our relationship with the whole CanMed community. That's what I would say about it. Excellent. We appreciate that. And we appreciate you, Akeem, and look forward to seeing you down in, in Marco Island. I look forward to it as well. Thank you very, very much for having me here today, Ben. Please stay warm because in Canada, it's cold and wet. <laughs> We're up in the Northeast. It's not much warmer where we are, but we'll do our best. Looking forward we'll to Florida. Best, yeah. I'm as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Hope you enjoyed my conversation with Akeem Gardner. Check out the links in the show description to learn more about the topics we discussed. And thanks again to this episode's sponsor, the American Cannabis Nurses Association. Our next episode drops February 21st. That's two weeks from today. In the meantime, please go to canmedevents.com and check out our speaker lineup and our poster presenters. While you're there, sign up for email alerts to get notified about all our event announcements. You can register for your ticket package through a link at canmedevents.com as well. And be sure to do that as soon as possible because our tickets are limited this year. Also, be sure to follow us on social media. We are on Instagram, X, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Just search for CanMed Events. And lastly, we appreciate it if you would rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast on whichever method you use to consume us. All right, stay safe, stay healthy, and be sure to come back for the next CanMed Coffee Talk. <laughs>